Yeah. So, please come. So, the friends would be uh, Natalie, uh, Shalawan, and. Okay, test one, two, three. Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the talk series 23 by SOAD Architecture Program, together with DES Lab, supported by Media Lab and Sparking Lab. My name is Atisaya Jilat Hawan Gun. It is my pleasure to be the MC of this talk on behalf of SOAD Architecture Program, Kim Mongut, University of Technology, Tonburi. Today, I am here with Kun Masin, Dr. Acharawan Jutarat and Ajahn Egawad Opad Ponsagon in the theme of leading sustainable change in the built environment. To discuss about the ideas relevant to the 17 sustainable design development, de development goals in architectural design and the roles that architects should be taking today to strengthen the world's direction towards sustainability. Now allow me to introduce Dr. Acharawan Jutarat the Head of Design for Environmental and Sustainable Development, DES Lab, for the opening of our talk today. Thank you very much, Indy. Um, and uh, greeting everyone, good morning, and good morning, our guests, at the, uh, Natalie Masin and Ajahn Ekawat Naka. Thank you very much for, for visiting us, especially Natalie. Uh, she have gone all the way from Denmark to Bangkok and spent some time with us. And we are very honored to have her here. Actually, the purpose of, of uh, this talk is actually to share uh, our expertise and experience and knowledge and our thought on sustainability. And would like to inspire you guys as a young generation, what can we do? All right, and, and not only that, we would like to have that at the uh, uh, archive for our school as well. Like to outreach also, we have streaming today to outreach to the people. And actually, uh, I have known our guest, uh, Natalie, since 2018 in Bangladesh in Acacia Conference, actually by the introduction of Ishtiak, our good friend from Bangladesh, Nakataka. At that time, she showed us the book, actually, uh, An Architecture Guide to the UNSDG, the first version. 
And so I thought, oh, we should have that one to promote in Thai version. And that really inspired me. And that's how I know uh, Natalie. And then we, uh, under uh, Thai Green Building Foundation, we initiate the book with the inspiration from her book. And then, and then it's very good chance that Natalie, yeah, this is yeah. the book yeah, the, from, from us. You guys can also download the digital version on the website, on the Thai Green Building Institute website. And, and, and then in the past summer, uh, our School of Architecture also had a chance to visit uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, you know, our professor Ekawat, me, also Indy, and some of our students to visit the uh, UIA World Congress, World Architecture Congress, organized by Kun Natalie Mosin, and it's very inspiring and it's eye opening for our students. Naka. And so, so that's how uh, we, we really think this is very good topic and we should really share to, to many of us as much as we can. So it here come to have our uh, talk today. Naka. And, and we hope that everyone can learn and benefit from our talk. Uh, and thank you very much for coming. And yes, over to you. Thank, Thank you, so uh, As mentioned before, our theme today is leading sustainable change in the built environment. And here, our speakers have prepared three topics, which are the roles of architects leading sustainable change in built environment, integrating SDGs in design and education processes, case study in north of Thailand, and decode selected sustainable architecture for community to share with everyone in this room and on the online platform. And now we will start with the first session with the role of architects leading sustainable change in built environment by Kun Natalie Mossen, the head of Institute at the Royal Danish Academy, Institute of Architecture and Technology, and the president of Congress for the UIA Congress, UIA World Congress of Architects 2023, Sustainable Future Leaves No One Behind. I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for this introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy that, the, that it's possible to be together here today. Um, some of what I will say, I mean, I know that you all, through the good work done here, I know that you already know the SDGs. So, uh, and there'll be more on that in the second talk. So I'll dive into talking about um, how we can then scale up and get more like these good examples uh, in the very near future. And let's see if I can. Um, so recently, um, uh, my team published uh, this, uh, this book, Innovation of Nothing. I'll get back to why we call it Innovation of Nothing. Uh, but um, um, I'll take you through some of the concepts from that volume. And that's also available as a resource uh, uh, as a uh, ISU document if you want to dive into it and I put in a more a bit more content in this lecture than there'll be time within the 25 minutes so again uh, for those who are interested we can share the slides because then there'll be a bit more info than what I have time to to share now um, but um, basically so why why do we need to lead sustainable innovation in the built environment we have a climate and biodiversity crisis. We just this morning talked about how it's felt acutely on this campus uh, with the water rising. We cannot solve um, these problems by building as usual. We need new practice, new means of action, new means of uh, innovation and problem solving. Then this uh, planetary crisis is also a crisis of overconsumption, overproduction, and maybe sometimes overconstruction. That's where the nothing or the reduction comes in. So we need to invent, innovate, but we also need to develop our uh, abilities to engage in planet-centered innovation uh, to, to reach those goals. Um, let's see. So I'll introduce uh, three, did I, did I skip one? No, I don't, I don't think I did. So I'll introduce three concepts. And of course you know them, but uh, uh, we need to talk about what does it mean that something is sustainable? Why do we need that? How do we enable innovation to happen? What is innovation leadership? 
And then I want to talk about subtraction as a solu solution model. How can we solve this crisis of, or how can we also solve this crisis by sometimes doing less or subtracting from our solutions? And the image you see is of one of the SDG pavilions erected in Copenhagen this summer, where what used to be a, a historical Danish building tradition of using thatch is uh, reinvented for an industrial, uh, industrialized uh, age and an urban context. Um, yeah, it's changing here. It will change there as well, I think. Oh yeah, here it is. So first, the concept of sustainability. Uh, I, I think maybe many of you have seen this diagram of uh, of uh, the planetary boundaries uh, and the, how they're being how they have been crossed already today, because when we talk about what is sustainability, it's really the essence of that is to uh, uh, provide the opportunity for future generations to prosper on this planet the same way we have a chance to prosper, and that means that we must operate within uh, planetary boundaries. Already today, uh, six of the nine boundaries are crossed, and, uh, and we can feel that and experience that all over the world. So this is uh, urgent. What you see on that slide is, uh, is a call for action, because uh, if we carry on as we do today, these conditions that our children and grandchildren and their children will, uh, will live in uh, will be uh, much different from, from today because of the rapid changes. We need to roll that back we need to operate within uh, the safe space of the planet. Uh, a way to express that and a very powerful way to express that are the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which you luckily have already been introduced to very much and which you'll hear more about in the next lecture. But this, of course, you can always, there's always uh, details, but the 17 goals are really the best tool we have to understand where we need to go because they uh, bring together uh, social sustainability and environmental sustainability, and we cannot achieve what we need to achieve without considering the complexity of what the 17 goals show together. Um, one example, again, because these slides will be fairly dry, so just to also give you some architecture, one example of what can it mean to take serious planetary boundaries uh, the, the challenge of environmental sustainability is shown in this small extension of a rural school in Denmark. It's built by the renowned company Henning Larsen Architects. Uh, and what they try to do here uh, is to demonstrate how uh, material choice, when done strategically, can really uh, help us towards a building practice that is within the safe uh, operating uh, space of the planet. So here it's the uh, local bio-based materials uh, and materials that can store more carbon than they emit. So this project is not absolutely sustainable in the sense that there's mo still more way to go. For instance, there's still use of uh, metal uh, screws for the foundation and other things that you could take forward in the next project. But this project goes a long way towards um, showing that you can use something as humble and simple as, uh, as uh, the straw the leftover from uh, our uh, big, uh, in Den Denmark, big uh, uh, production of uh, wheat uh, and, uh, and create these uh, walls uh, of straw bale in an, and they are done industrialized. Henning Larsen did this project to try to push a sustainable practice because uh, nobody wants to do this for the first time. But this small school, this small extension, they could do it. And now, because they have done it and the results are good and you have really great indoor climate uh, in that space and people like the school, now bigger clients say, okay, we are ready to do this as well. So now they, Henning Larsen Architects have a huge project of um, about 50,000 square feet coming up using this uh, product as a, as, a, as a wall construction system. That could not have happened without the willingness to do that first innovative project. Um, but then uh, how do we, uh, what is innovation? What do we mean with that? And now comes some fairly sli uh, dry slides. And, uh, and I've written quite a bit on these slides so you can, those who are interested can revisit later. Um, but basically when we talk about innovation, it's not just an idea. It's, a, it's an implemented idea. 
And that's the core of, uh, of understanding what we need by innovation. It's moving an idea of something that could be done differently into practice. Um, some innovations are fundamentally new. Many ideas are incrementally new. There's something new about them, but it doesn't have to be all new. For instance, the, uh, the thatch that I showed in that pavilion from the harbor is a historically uh, used material in Denmark, but it's then reinvented for a new age and a new purpose. So I think it's important that we also uh, uh, acknowledge and appreciate innovation when we transfer a known solution from one area to another, from one time to another. Uh, it does not have to be fundamentally new, but it can be used in a new context and the effect is new. Uh, so, uh, so we should look at, uh, when we look at innovation, we should look at how are we, how are we helping change a practice today that's not meeting today's need. When we do uh, do that, we can draw on all kinds of other fields, uh, other uh, uh, knowledge domains at other periods of time. And by reapplying that to the new problems, that's innovation. Um, it's also important to, to think about uh, the fact that there are different types of innovation, because as architects, we tend to think that innovation must be the product. It has a new look, it implements a new component, but it could also be that we uh, build in a different way, that we innovate the process of, of how to do things by, for instance, training local craftsmen. It could also be, or with this example of the, of the bigger project that the Henning Larsen's architects uh, are doing in the straw bale, a field next to that building site will be used to produce the straw. So creating a novel kind of infrastructure by producing material right next to the building site. That's not a product innovation, that's a process innovation. You could also say that we need a sale and customer innovation. Could we, for instance, quite often architects are, um, uh, or business innovation, quite often architects are given their fee on the basis of how much we do. So if we suggest an extra big project, we will get an extra big fee. But maybe uh, when, we, uh, when we are consuming too much on this planet, maybe sometimes we need to uh, advise the client that they could do a bit fewer square meters, but have more quality in those square meters. How do we then innovate in our business model so that we as architects are compensated for, for moving that solution in the right direction rather than punished uh, for doing fewer square meters? Um, and, uh, uh, and innovation happens at many levels. Sometimes as architects, we get a bit frustrated over the barriers and we say, okay, it has to happen at the level of society. How can I do this when, uh, when the economic structures, when the laws governing architecture are the same? Because we do need that change at a societal level, but we also can create change at industry level and we can create it at company level. And we can even create innovation in the individual projects. So, so it's important, of course, in understanding innovation to see those levels and push for those uh, high level innovations, but to, to remain hopeful and be able to have agency in our practices architects, we should know that, that we can start also at company level. And then we can band together uh, in our architectural uh, associations to work at industry level and eventually at the level of society. Um, and then what we will also encounter often is that there is a lot of investment in what we already have. Architecture as an industry where there's a lot of material investments in production methods as they are today. People who own uh, an aluminium factory want to continue to produce aluminium windows because that's how they make their fortune. There's a lot of investment in the way things are now. A lot of people prosper from keeping doing things exactly as they are today. And that's also important to understand because we need the change, but when we uh, uh, then encounter, say we have a great idea to how to do things more sustainably and we don't understand why not everybody doing this. It's such a good improvement. So it's important to understand that there is so much investment in the way things are so that, uh, so that we do not lose uh, uh, our hope uh, in, in change because we, because we will encounter this uh, uh, wish to uh, keep things just the way they are. And the way to counter that is to work with niches. Find that one client, find that uh, great engineer, uh, find those craftsmen, that uh, contractor who are interested and has a, um, an engagement like yourself in doing something better. 
because then architecture has a wonderful, wonderful way of, uh, of changing uh, people's understanding of what is possible once it's realized. So once you have that little school I showed you before, you can get the next project. So if you find uh, the good people like that school board, those craftsmen, and you get something done that shows a way forward, and that's again like all these wonderful examples in the SDG guide, then you can point to that and you can get hopefully that bigger scale and eventually change the mainstream. But it can be very good to, um, to know how much investment there is in the status quo uh, as it is today and then try to find those people with whom you can make that niche to get started and to show uh, the mainstream practice that something else is possible. So key takeaways is that the innovation is not just a result of an innovative idea, it's also very much about getting the implementation uh, happening. Uh, innovation at a big scale happens when we manage to push on all kinds of levels, both from companies, from the culture, what people demand, the resources available to us, uh, the sort of the structures around uh, governing laws and so on. Uh, but we can sort of that, that big chain of, um, of movement, we can get that started through smaller uh, um, change projects. Um, and we can investigate how architecture can move cultural norms and, uh, and generate uh, this uh, legitimacy for, uh, for different kind of projects. Like, uh, like again, the small uh, uh, straw bale house, before you have it, people would say, I don't want to live in a straw bale house. That seems less solid than all the stuff we've been doing all the 20th century. So you need to see it, you need to experience a good indoor climate to then feel, yeah, hey, that, this is actually a good solution for where I am in the world today. Um, so we need to, uh, so to get to, the, uh, uh, to get those results, we need to understand the, the system we're operating within and what's holding it back uh, and find uh, a path to actually create change. Um, oh, sorry, going the wrong way here. Uh, and then an example uh, of, um, of innovation is this uh, project from France. Um, there's a, I, I suppose you also here have a lot of uh, 20th century uh, concrete slab uh, housing blocks and some of them have a need of renovations or, or um, uh, are not up to date in the, in the, in the indoor climate and uh, functionality. So this project also needed uh, an improved energy performance, but the, the architects were very innovative. So they did a classic um, insulation scheme on the north facade, but in the south, rather than uh, insulating just with a layer of insulation, they created insulation by adding a new space. So this new space uh, it created a, an additional living space. It, um, it, uh, it improves and changes the layouts of the flats and it uh, and it also changes the perception of this block by the whole community who was looking because uh, in France in this uh, in these um, suburbs there's also some social stigma sometimes to these houses but actually the architects found out that the people living there love the house so helping also to um, for the house to, to stay, but be uh, regarded in a more positive way by the surroundings were also important social uh, innovation, adding to the social sustainability. So the, the architects solved the task they were giving by improving the energy performance. But they were truly innovative in adding co-benefits that are so much larger than simply the, the lower energy bill. And um, um, it's a house that, uh, it's a project that deserves closer examination but they, but they just worked very carefully, uh, both within and outside the systems. They, they, they did more than they were asked for. They did it in a clever way where they could add this without people having to be relocated. This could be constructed uh, while the building was uh, in use. And they also, uh, because of this middle layer that's not uh, fully inside, they could also add it without within the uh, French uh, system governing uh, housing in these areas without changing uh, the rent, which is super important for, for, for low-cost housing because it does not count as indoor square meters. Uh, so a very, very uh, elegant uh, project uh, within something that's actually uh, quite, uh, I think for many architects would have looked like a very constrained, a very normal assignment, uh, improves the energy performance of this block, 
do it and move on. Uh, they did uh, so much more with that. Uh, and then this uh, uh, this uh, a challenge of also sometimes thinking of subtraction as a solution model. Um, and uh, quite often uh, we have, we're very used to uh, adding when we solve problems. And of course, that not just in architecture, but overall, we're quite often rewarded uh, to add when there's a problem. So if somebody, uh, well, we need the space to do this, then as an architect, oh, I can, I can create such a space and add it to your building. Uh, that's the normal way of, of doing things. And um, research has shown uh, a tendency to adding rather subtracting across fields. And what you see on the, uh, in the image is a clinical research where a lot of people were asked to stabilize this roof of this little Lego model, uh, even uh, rewarded in the solving to use as, li as little material as possible. What you could have done is simply take one Lego away and lower the roof. What basically everybody did was adding bricks to stabilize the roof at that higher level. Uh, and what the clinical researchers, uh, this is a psycholo uh, um, psychological study, what it basically shows is just that we often tend to default. We just right away go to adding and then salt. It takes a bit more thinking uh, and a bit more effort to think about could I subtract something and have an equally good solution? Uh, and we are not as easily rewarded for that, and that's another problem. But um, I think that's also some of what uh, Rem Cole has tried to show at the Fundamentals uh, Venice Biennale in 14 with this installation in the main exhibition. He was showing how much we add, and sometimes by adding all of that technology, what he's showing in this space, we're taking away the whole spatial experience. Uh, so I think I think that was a very strong uh, exhibition, worth revisiting in these times, and uh, one that was pointing towards uh, some of the things we need to to do today. So the example I brought here is uh, Baumschlaber Evelis uh, headquarters for themselves, uh, called 2226 Lusenau. Uh, this was probably only possible because this architectural company was uh, res had enough resources to build their headquarters. They probably would ne never have gotten a client to do this because they have created a house with no heating, cooling, or mechanical ventilation. And this is in a climate that changes quite a lot over the seasons. And still, through the design itself, the building at all time have an office interior between 22 and 26 centuries which is the ordinary demand by clients in, in this uh, context. Um, the reason they could do it is that they work very carefully. They know the amount of people working in the house. They know what they're doing, the amount of electrical equipment, adding heat, like computers and so on. Uh, and then they worked uh, with, the, with the building itself, with natural ventilation, with the, with the thickness of the walls, with the daylight uh, to create this kind of building where it's the architecture that solves the heating and cooling and ventilation, not mechanical systems. Uh, so this is a way and an example of um, subtracting, subtracting a lot of systems. They got added ceiling height, of course, because they did not need all that stuff you saw in the Rem Kohlhaas uh, picture. And you get some other qualities of the building and you, and you save the environment from the impact of all that uh, production of all those uh, uh, docks and the maintenance of them. But, uh, uh, but what they had to do was to spend more hours, more architectural hours, more engineering hours. There was more thought put into this process. So, um, uh, so what I think Baumschlaber Eberle showed is that it is possible to take away some of the layers we have added over time, and that's not adding, not helping the environment, not helping, helping the architecture, but that it probably takes additional mental work. And to begin to think like that takes some mental uh, work as well, but can maybe be trained in architecture school. Um, and now I should begin to think of the time, I think. How much time left? Eight minutes, because then I will not go too much into these roles. You can get the PDF you, if you want, but 
basically, uh, we uh, uh, in doing this uh, book, uh, we interviewed companies who have happened, who have had, who have succeeded in uh, in going from uh, from an innovative idea to implementation. One of them is Seoul, uh, a modern industrial product inspired by the way uh, seaweed was used traditionally in Denmark. Um, and what we could see looking across those cases was that you can take many roles in uh, helping uh, in leading sustainable innovation. And I'll not go into uh, uh, all the details, uh, but sometimes you might think that the only role possible is the inventor, that you as an architect have to invent this novel solution and that's a way to be a part of this uh, important movement but you can also uh, you can also be the person uh, that help uh, because of, of course the inventor is an important role but it's not the only one you can also uh, be the one that helps solve the problems of the in transmitting that idea into innovation into realization for instance identifying potential um, problems as they are pursued by customers or regulation agencies or you can be, uh, if you are employed, and many architects are, in an approving authority, you can help by doing that extra work of getting a novel solution uh, through uh, the planning process. Um, we need the donors as well, the foundations, the philanthropists, because uh, the donors can, of course, both su support a project when it's very vulnerable and do not yet have the commercial value, uh, but a donor, uh, if they are like the Aga Khan, can also give uh, a lot of standing to a novel solution that will help it get uh, accepted and the wider uh, uh, use. You can also, if you're in academia, be the Connemore expert, the person who are not who have no commercial interest in a new idea, but helps uh, qualify that it works, help move it forward, that it. Um, um, that people will believe in it. Um, uh, and a, a gatekeeper, that could be an architect who is a juror of an international design competition or a national one. You can help your peers by recognizing good ideas and helping arguing why they are uh, actually solving the problem at hand. Um, and of course, architects also work with or for or as clients, and you can give uh, somebody that first job, like that small school extension. Um, if you don't have that first client, it's very difficult to show the results. But uh, And not everybody like Bounce Labor and Eberly can be their own client. So the, the key takeaway here, uh, yeah, five minutes, <laughs> uh, are, are, are to say that as architects, there are many roles you can play. It's not uh, the roles uh, we need because it is collaborative to change uh, the industry are not tied to one person or one profession. So find those uh, fellow travelers, find those collaborators, and also help mo move other people's good ideas forward in the various roles you will play over a lifetime in the profession. Um, all roles are equally important, and every architect can play a role. And I'm showing this uh, image of Jas Jasmin Lai from the UIA World Congress of Architects this summer. She's somebody who has done, been uh, tremendous in uh, in helping uh, make possible housing for the impoverished. She was not per se the architect of all those thousands of homes, but she has played all those other roles at different times. Um, and then just briefly in the end, so what does that mean for you as architecture students? It means that you have to train what we call dynamic capabilities. You have to have your deep architectural understandings, but you also have to be able to navigate in a world that's changing. Because uh, we do not have all the answers uh, of how to create those sustainable solutions. You cannot go out there. Yes, luckily you can see some examples and that's really valuable, but you cannot go out there and just copy the way things are done today. You have to move that forward. And that's not a linear process. That's a more of a, a uh, that's a more complex process that requires you to be agile when you meet obstacles and when you uh, and when you have to move something along that's not usual business, not the way things are done normally uh, by the mainstream industry. So, uh, so you have to have that combination to link with other professions, with other fields, and move your own mindset along as you uh, get new information. So, uh, really, what planets and the innovation calls for, and I'll conclude uh, here, 
is uh, to have an understanding of how you can learn across disciplines because these challenges, the 17 goals across disciplines, but also believe that you have something to add to all those other professions with your viewpoints as architects. You have to uh, train your dynamic cap capabilities and you do that in architecture through the studio work, through uh, working with open-ended prop uh, problems. And you have to engage in collaborative leadership where you think of it as your responsibility to help move a sustainable agenda forward, but do it with others because obviously nobody can do it alone. Uh, and then, uh, uh, I'll, is there still a couple of minutes? Then I'll just, uh, I just wanted to show very briefly some examples of how some of the master students at the Royal Danish Academy Institute of Architecture and Technology are working with these things. So these are just a few slides. I'll not have time to give you all the, the details of the projects. Maybe we can talk after the session. But uh, we have an international master's in computation and architecture where we work with uh, uh, very high-tech computational uh, tools. Uh, but we do that also to be able to, to move material practices, to, um, uh, to, for instance, use all of the wood because we can know more about uh, where we need the high, uh, the high quality wood. Uh, where is, uh, during industrialization, we have sort of thrown away half and only used high quality because that's so easy. You can use that everywhere. But really, we need to uh, use these uh, advanced tools to, to reconnect with an ability to use the whole trunk once we take it down. It, uh, and that's just one example. We also have a master's program called Settlement ecology and tectonics where we work very material based and do these physical experiments with craftsmen, uh, with producers from all of the uh, industry uh, to get that, uh, um, uh, to, to get those sort of knowledge flows where we find out what can we learn from those other fields, how can that move our practice forward, how can we help what they're doing. Uh, in this case to sort of uh, uh, work with this uh, theme of the thatch as a modern uh, cladding uh, material. Um, and we have a master's program called Architecture and Extreme Environments, where every year we go on a field trip to, uh, uh, to a place in the world where climate change uh, is especially felt, uh, to try to uh, propose solutions, test them, and then go back and learn in, uh, in the projects we're doing. Uh, and again, working closely in the in the field between intellectual research, artistic practice, uh, and uh, and the architectural proposal. Um, and then I will not have time to go into the Copenhagen principles, but uh, but uh, I think that might be uh, could be a lead into the next presentation, because uh, at the World Congress this summer, at the conclusion, we presented. 10 principles um, that can then be interpreted for local uh, adaptation to, uh, to, to um, uh, accompany discussions on the SDGs, uh, what can architecture do and how should we in principle uh, work uh, to contribute to the full. So with that, I'll just thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, look forward to hearing the next presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Kanali Mason for your incredible insight on the roles of architects in sustainability. Kunagli will be with us again for the Q&A session at the end. For everyone here, please keep your question in mind. And for everyone online, you can send us your question in the comment section. Thank you, Natalie. Now, we'll continue to the second session on the topic of integrating SDG in design and education processes, case studies in north of Thailand by Dr. Acharawan Tutarat, the head of the Building Technology and Innovation Track, the head of Design for Environmental and Sustainable Development, DES Lab, and former chairperson for architecture program of SOAD KUTT. Please welcome Dr. Acharawan. Thank you very much, Indy. Okay, so uh, I think one more. No, this is not my. Yeah, we need to move a bit further. Okay, I see. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, good morning, everyone. So uh, I would like to share my, my
my own projects uh, that we, we did um, with the university on the two projects in north of Thailand, uh, how we integrate SDGs in design and educational processes. Actually, um, actually uh, education is also my passion. Also environment is my passion. That's how I become professors and, and I aware in the environment. And therefore I thought how in, in my roles, how can I make good impact to society? And so um, with a lot of thought, so okay, yes, first I become educator. And then how, how educator can, 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 can do anything. So, so not only that, uh, in parallel, we do the design professional as well as uh, community services and, and also um, uh, help on the professional groups as well. So I would like to share as uh, the educator, uh, design for community as well as the, I uh, the, was the uh, immediate past chair of the Arcasia Committee on Green and Sustainable Architecture as well as secretary of Thai Green Building Foundation. So we do our own roles. First, uh, yeah, I, I show the two projects that we, it's a real project that I integrated into the class. It's called Work Integrated Learning or WIL Wheel. All right. So the first project is in Tak province, the border pa patrol police school in Tak or north of Thailand province. And then the second project is Bokler School in Nan province. So uh, let's talk about the first project, Border Patrol Police School in the province. Actually, uh, at that time, there's no, no UN SDG guide yet. But actually, the way we do, I think I can map and you can see how it's online with the SDG. But the second project is already there, so it's better online and alignment to SDG. So first, we, we have four universities all together to work on this project to raise the fund uh, because the school is quite a, the very remote. And we have KMUTT, uh, Jularongkorn University, or CU Thammasat University, and Prince Kalayani Watana Institute of Music. The four universities all together, we organize to raise fund, and then at that time, we raise for 15 million baht. That's quite a lot. And, and then uh, we also integrate to the class, Naka. not only architecture, we talk to uh, civil engineering, uh, environmental engineering department, how they could get involved on as a part of projects. And then we have not only the design processes, we, we, we ask them to be in the construction and after construction process, to you know how we train the hip tribe children and so on. So so the cost of the project is about five million, but including everything, you know, transportation, labor cost, and construction costs for about 360 square meters. Um, yeah. So this is the, the fundraising um, activities where we have our uh, admin of the university and of the school for the fundraising and and I also integrated into some classes for them to help designing and then evaluate the building performance. How is the thermal comfort and also the wind ventilation, well-being as well as, well as the water collection. Actually, um, actually, we started from the needs of the people. We went to the site and then we identify obstacles and underlying issues. What are critical problems there? You see, Tak province and Tha Tong Yang is quite far, but you know where that is? It's near Melody in Myanmar. You just cross the border. And, and then to come from Bangkok, it takes from eight to nine hours. So, so then, then, for construction, we cannot build traditional because then the con, con, uh, the transportation cost will make the building more expensive. And so, and then you see the road, there's no concrete, it's like a dirt road and then there are available woods, you know, but they, they cut some local woods. So, so, so we have to also uh, train the people to be aware of, and then the, the second issue is about water. It seems like there are a lot of water available. However, 
uh, this site, the, this school where Chulalongkorn students, they go every year for volunteer development camp and there's a problem with the skin, skin rash, and then many of them went to hospitals. So I thought, what happened? So I, I asked the environmental professors to, to take samples of water to test. Oh my God, there are four sources of water, underground water, canals, lakes, and so on, all contaminated with the metals, with the heavy metals, because some of the manufacture there. Anyway, so we thought we have to collect the rainwater, all right, and to, to filtering water at the very, principle and they cannot drink water all right but we have to have clean water and then sometimes when it rains they don't have electricity because the it's at the end of the line of electricity is not very stable so the second thing that we need to 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 do is the electricity and they have only three lecturers three teachers and hundreds of students I asked how do they learn, they said they cannot teach all the classes, they have only three professors. So they use internet to do the distance learning to Krai Kang Won School. It's like uh, the central uh, online where they can they can make a long distance to, to, to turn on for students to learn. Okay, and, and so that means electricity is important to conduct the class as well as environment. The children, they throw the trash, along the beautiful site so we need to teach them about that and so along the way we we also look what is the identity is there very beautiful fabric weaving fabric that represents the nature the plant and thing but but the younger generation they are not aware of they just want to forget so i thought this we should encourage them to value their own then how so so we this is a site how it looks is beautiful the school and then the the master plan they have placed the students can grow their own food as well so we come with a vision that well we we should have a good will to to help them for well-being to be aware of environment and their culture through learning process all right, so that is our vision. So we came with several strategies like rainwater collection, prefabrication techniques, uh, not at a container, but at the panels and pieces, you know, and then we chip it there. And then some of the product we use local, like a wooden windows and, you know, of course, water collection and zero hunger. You know, we, we teach them how to grow and then use some renewable energy. So that comes from our vision, our will, transformed into the design strategies, you know. And so it, it fits with several of the UN SDG, for example, Zero Hunger. We have the site where, where children can, can grow their own crops and take care of the food and animals as the, a part of their classes. And then well-being by having good ventilation, light and, and water as the, also a part of the training from our student to the students, okay? Affordable clean energy with some solar cells. We thought about, we have a BIPV, Building Integrated Photovoltaic, where students can see through and then it casts shadow that they can learn, oh, what is it? And then they learn about that. And then responsible consumption, we use uh, renewable energy and also um, recycled material, local materials, and more important is partnerships. So um, this is the school and then uh, very small and, and it's used as a multi-purpose. When there is no summer, when, when during the class time, they use as the classroom and reading room upstairs. But during the summer time, uh, students in Bangkok together, they, they travel to the site and use as a accommodation where they can teach children uh, over there, the Hill Tribe children. So these are all the look of the, uh, uh, the, the, then when the second floor is used as a staff lounge and also bedrooms for female, Stud, uh, female volunteers and downstairs is for male volunteers and we have proper toilets for them and shower rooms for them yes and uh, 
So these are uh, the site where it is, and it's quite um, simple and and mimic the uh, the Papagayo is like huge tribal form of the building, and also integrate solar cell in the front and and integrated um, uh, daylighting into the class. Yes having also rainwater collection and to be aware of their culture we we study on the east uh, the the west side of the facade to have the cnc cut and enlarge the fabric patterns up to the facade and it casts a very nice shadow on the circulations and so uh, they are aware of and then they pass it every day and then the room is high and then with some natural light and wind and also slidable windows um, and then on the roof we have the recycle from the uh, the milk carton and the, the roof materials with uh, reflective material color with um, insulation as well also we develop the sliding door but yeah we use local to do that and then recycled uh, furniture uh, materials for furniture so that is the, uh, the, the the first project that they are very happy and enjoy uh, every year camp at Ta Tong Yang at this site. Then let's come to the next site is Bokleur School. It's a female dormitory uh, in Nan province. Uh, and then of course the university uh, has got the funding from uh, the private fund from the Princess Sillington uh, a private office to sponsor this one is called about 15 million but to 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 build this one almost 1000 square meter site okay and and why do they need dormitory because the hill tribe they stay very far like 50 kilometers 70 kilometers away and they don't have many schools so so we need to build a dormitory for them to stay and then they go back during the weekend and of course, we, we established a good team, good partners. Yeah, KMUGT, SOAD, also civil engineering by the help of Ajahn Game Naka, as a designer. And then, and then we, uh, with Sanki, construction, steel construction company, because there's earthquake around that area. So we shall have uh, the steel structure. All right, and then and then together with some sponsor from Sanko Bank, TOA and SDG. Actually, yesterday Sanko Bank also visited the building because they innovate the new plaster. They said that plaster on on the the wall is kind of flexible. With the earthquake, it won't crack. So they went there to check their performance of the building. I also need to go back to check how students they live in the dormitory, how happy they are, what's the quality of the building, something like that. Anyway, we thought the concept we should, this is a dormitory at the school. We thought, why don't building to become a teacher for children? You know, the school as a teacher. So, okay. So um, during the design processes, of course, we have our students and environmental students to, to come and to talk to them to get the requirement. And during the construction at the end, we also train them, not only students who, are, who will stay, but teachers as well. We also develop the QR code everywhere for them to learn. All right. Well, they, they have the, the cell phone, of course. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So actually, um, of course, uh, it rains a lot. We see the opportunity to use water. We collect water. It's very moist and very cold during winter time, and hot and humid during summer time. So it's necessary to have very thin building, not too deep, for natural ventilation and light for the thermal comfort. And when the dormitory, they cannot have two person per room because it's, it's in a rural area. So they stay 12 students per room. So we have to design quiet, you know, and, and quite a good uh, living. And then they have problem with drying their clothes because it's very humid. If the cloth won't dry, it's very smelly and fungus so we have to design the, the roof at the end of the roof to to have the glass in order to let the sun radiation to dry out the cloth 
so we can contribute to positive values. And and I listened to to uh, uh, Natalie. I thought mm, we should have first goodwill and positive attitude, good listening skills in order to to really combine everything to come true. All right. So so yes, we align with the SDG and also education and reduce resource consumption by having another modular system all right and then and then we have also of course integrate with the landscape design to have that grow and integrate with lecturer there as the part of the class that students take care of their own plot of plant okay and so so this is the final outcome the building cross orientation the style they get the solar cell zero hunger and then and then well-being you know good no no not too much noise we did also questionnaire before they move in at the existing dormitory oh they said they cannot sleep because of the noise disturbance so the good noise and then uh not, not so much noise good education for them water collection and so pv as well as the school act at the central of community they have like a market and then incubation for students in front of the school for them to be able to practice start up coffee shop for example start up art and craft shop for uh, students to learn as well as the partnership with community with sponsors with school universities so so this really align with the sdg so we integrating design in overall context and in urban fabric to make it accessible and inclusive and share with enlightened you know enlightened in the environment okay so um landscape we have by all swell we work with the landscape professor to to grow the brand that that the, the water left from the sewer system can be by all swell from the rain and then water harvest and then utilize potential from the solar and the wind with some local identity on the brick and the pattern of the fabric for the daylight and utilize prefabrication technique. This is the plan where the north is up above. You see, we collect a lot of water, rainwater on the, on the upper hill. So when there is no electricity, they can get the water to the down, to the a lower level by gravity yeah i i went there sometimes there's no electricity so we have to have the solar cell as well all right and then the first floor is the lounge where children come to to do their homework when they when they're not going to bed yet then they don't have to work turn on the light when when their friend's sleeping so we have the student lounge to share the working area with the insect screen, of course, and then the, and then each room, uh, twelve rooms that have uh, each room has twelve students. Yes, and then this is downstairs. It have the toilet and then laundry area where they can hang dry the clothes. With the BIPV on the top, you see the solar cell BIPV on the top that they can hang dry the clothes, and we calculate the 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 power the the. Uh, the solar cell that it should be enough to to be able to use during the night time but anyway we we have some battery backup of course yeah so it's quite a simple we use natural light and white color and then you see the cable it have the maybe modify uh, patterns into the interior and then acoustic ceiling very simple and then quite a, a proportion of the window that can be operable with insect screen. The proportion of Northern, yeah, this is the laundry area with also some of the design of the rainwater collection that allows students to open and close so that they are, are able to take care of their own, not others, you know. They take care of the water. After it rain, it, the water clean the, the, the roof. After 10 minutes, they cross and then collect the water so so and then the prototyping actually 
we have the inspiration very first from solar decathlon 2014 all right we build container but we learned that oh it's expensive to have container so then the second version on that okay we have some some partial like uh, um, uh, uh, panels and and steel and then this one we also have uh, some chip you know some of the material to to build there and we train the people how to do the uh, light construction as well all right yeah and so this is the model then where it's on the hilly type and then we rest elevated floor for the water to be able to seep down it's very steep site yeah, it's very steep site. And so this is the, the site. But you, what you see is uh, the existing dormitory that is not enough and quite noisy. So this one, we do the cross ventilation and so on. See, and then and then we have um, the solar cell and then natural light and then design for disaster or the earthquake with the steel structure yeah so we have some breathing technique the first one the first building we have some kind of steel and concrete but this one is steel yes but some of the floor is concrete yeah to be able to to be flexible and then prefabrication with the light construction of the wall and and so it's good enough that we calculate the sound reduction yeah, and, and moisture uh, protection and then the roof material with the insulation. Yeah, rainwater collection like that. Yeah. Then, uh, yes, we also think about separating waste management for the children, also indoor material, a low VOC. And, and also integrating with the landscape for bioswell edible garden and then dust protection from the road. And then we also went to measure uh, before, you know, at the existing dormitory and ask them how they prefer, how do they feel. But then after COVID, I need to go back again to measure the new, how they experience in, in the dormitory. So, yeah. Then thus, in summary, the lesson learned that I think in my opinion, partnership is very important. We have to plan together and not only plan together, we work together. If we don't plan together and act together, that will never happen. And then not only that, we have to collaborate, coordinate and manage cross-discipline. It's very important. And know, know how is not enough, but know who as well. Then the second part as an educator, as the main role, we integrate SDG in the work, integrated learning. I think many of our professor is doing that already yeah, throughout the class and students activity. And we utilize resource available in the university like machine, uh, other professors, you know, and then we also collaborate with social lab where they get the funding. We ask them to support us to go, for example. But the, the the construction, we got the support from, from the sponsor. And then as the designer, we, we have to identify the critical obstacle and design throughout the SDG framework and see how design can bridge and challenge, you know, uh, for the effective in implementation in the long run, I say, in the long run, not on the short term, on the long term. And finally, I at the leadership at the immediate past chair of SDGSA and DGI, I thought, oh, we have some knowledge, we should share. So we established the book, we have the training, we organize seminar and many things and so on. So that is how I have my role into it. This is an example of the book, exhibition and talk throughout uh, my, my roles and responsibility. And so thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ka. Thank you, Ka, Dr. Sharawan uh, for sharing your experience on this sustainability. Uh, she will be with us again for the Q&A session after the talk. So remember to stay curious. Uh, thank you again.
And now to the last session of today, I'd like to welcome Adan Egawad Upadpunsagan, a former member of Thai Green Building Institute Committee and an expert in multiple design premises, including sustainable urban development and built environment design, who works as our thesis and design instructor for more than 20 years to share his topic about the co-selected sustainable architecture for community. Hello, everyone. Right. Okay. So today I'm gonna uh, talk about or kind of uh, talk about topic like uh, the co-selected sustainable architecture for communities. Okay. Uh, we got pretty short term, so uh, I select four projects to explain how architects as well as uh, their partners working together to deliver kind of uh, outstanding uh, sustainable design. Okay. Okay. Starting with uh, Joao Lungkon University Centenary Park. Okay. Uh, around Samyam area. Okay. This project is a kind of a uh, very really iconic and outstanding that uh, I have seen. It is a kind of a uh, project that could integrate landscape and architecture very well, well. It's merging together. Okay. So the, the site itself is uh, at uh, really close to Bantat Tong area. Okay. And the idea of this project is like, they want to kind of reduce kind of flooding inside the area and neighborhood. Okay. Uh, so this park is act as a retainer. Okay. Once it is got kind of a heavy rains, then they collect the water from the whole neighborhood, like uh, you you see the whole street access, right? Uh, that one and keep it in the site in the park itself. Okay, so the neighborhood will have less flood comparing to others area. Okay. okay, this is a view from the street that uh, they collect water. So the, the concept of the project itself is like a land tree. Okay, so those, those channels act as the roots that collect water to, towards the, the tree itself, the tree body itself. And this is the image of uh, the avenue, which is very nice. Okay, so uh, you see that uh, the lands the landscape. If you see many parks itself, they they gonna kind of a create park and then create building to support it to services. But this one is merging, okay, by a kind of a tilted to the angles of the landscape up or on the roof. So it's a kind of a largest uh, green roof project in Thailand at that time. And then to simulate that, uh, they kind of uh, let water running down and use nature nature to clean the water towards the pond at the front part of uh, of uh, the site. Right. Okay. So they got like really really huge uh, tree re uh, water tank underneath in order to collect water and reuse it inside the park at least it's like uh, used to uh, used to watering the the plant itself okay and along the way you see that they got different type of plants is so it's uh, that help to clean the water okay so it's like uh, giving education as well because they don't like a like a use just one particular type that is the best so they they got so many type of plants to create a kind of uh, varieties. Okay. And then the retention pond uh, at the front, uh, which also show the con this, where the con concept come from. Okay. Which is, uh, it was, it came from, came from uh, our former King Lamanai. Okay. So they also apply a kind of uh, the turbine as a bicycle one that you can also play and kind of feel 
uh, oxygen into the water. Right, so this is the image at the front. Okay, and it got sloped up towards uh, uh, the top one. So it creates very, very nice kind of a new perception to the cities. You can see a kind of a skyline of Bangkok on top as well. Okay, and once the slope tilting down, it becomes a kind of a sitting area that uh, on on the on that. Oops, sorry. All right, so like a, they got create sitting area, so they can create a stage and performance, and you can just sit on the grass very nicely with good slope. Okay, and so this one is very kind of a very successful, and they got so many activities along the way uh, all year round. Okay, and architecture itself is also very nice. Okay, they they use the kind of dry system that kind of a, uh, holding the bricks in a kind of a tie patterns. Okay, which also tilted according to the slope of uh, of the of the roof, okay. Then all the functions is inside those uh, air conditioning surrounding by large corridor. So meaning that uh, um, it's also kind of a reduced heat gain, heat that or sun direct sunlight that come into the inner or functional areas like uh, exhibition space, uh, cafeterias, and multi-purpose space. Okay, so like that. Okay, so this is a kind of a <clears throat> one of a really outstanding in decades, a uh, really outstanding project in decades of in Thailand, right? Okay, so if you have any chance, a chance, I think you should uh, try to visit there. It gives a kind of very good impression once you really sit in underneath the the green roof or even the top of the green roof. Right. Okay. And then uh, that kind of uh, integrate many kind of uh, activities in inside this project as well. Okay. So you can just uh, enjoy as well as uh, that got uh, eight outdoor classroom define uh, different topics like uh, herb rooms, gravel rooms, bamboo rooms, earth rooms, wine rooms, forest rooms, stone room, and sand rooms at the site as uh, the position that, that you can see. Okay. For example, this is a forest room. Uh, so uh, students or people can also kind of uh, uh, doing activities inside different rooms themselves. Okay. And this is Earth Room. We have a kind of a zigzag walkway along the way that you can also have fun with it. And then this is Y Room. And then Sand Room, which uh, uh, they apply like a, a kids playground with it. Okay. Also, uh, at the side of uh, this main area, they also got another small kind of uh, small playground like that. Okay, and it can also apply as a kind of, on the left side can apply as a sitting space to see the performance in the middle as well. While on the right side is a kind of different angles of a uh, of a uh, uh, slope in order to let kids select whatever they want to play with it, right? And this is how it works, okay? Once it's rain, they just leave a kind of a try collect the water in the middle area, okay? And let them kind of gradu um, gradually absorb it. Right, this is a construction. Okay. So that is the first project. Then the second project, Lentry International School. Okay. Uh, in this uh, project, they got two very large trees 
inside the site. So the designer figured out a way to kind of uh, embrace the tree by creating two different courtyard. Okay. So, uh, so the forms of the building come from that concept, become a shelf around the, the tree. Okay. So one courtyard is act as an active act uh, or support active activities, while another one more kind of a uh, um, uh, kind of a uh, more of a study studying space. Okay. And uh, the green the the project designers are uh, really kind of a uh, keen in terms of a uh, sustainable design and energy design. Okay, so they check everything that uh, how to make the wind flows inside the project very well as well as uh, how to reduce heat gain. Okay, why you see in the section also uh, they use a kind of a cressory to bring indirect light into the space. Okay, so you see they, they check the sun path to see uh, shadows that cast onto the site in different times, as well as uh, check the wind flows. Okay. Right. So it become a kind of a really good space that uh, kids can learn with nature. Okay. Apart from that, uh, they not only learn thing that uh, in, in this, uh, con the concept of this school, they think that learning can be everywhere. Okay, so it's not just inside the classroom, but the learning space also extended to the outside one, which means that uh, the corridor uh, of uh, this school is a lot larger comparing to kind of normal school. That thing that that they think the corridor is just for the walk for people to walk, but this one also for learning. Okay, so you see the condition of uh, the lighting inside the space is very nice okay so during the day they they don't have to uh, turn on the light at all okay right and this is a kind of uh, active space for kids to play okay And they got kind of uh, this this uh, space in in the middle, which have like a <clears throat> uh, open open wells. Okay, this will also drive the wind throughout the project. Help to drive the wind throughout the projects, right? Okay, so this project also very really successful in terms of uh, create a kind of. Uh, uh, really nice environment for the kids. All right, the next project is more kind of a commercials. In the past, uh, <clears throat> uh, mostly once we're talking about shopping mall, okay, we, we always think about a department store, big department store that uh, fully air conditions, okay. But then after around two uh, thousands, okay, that got uh, that got many companies that try to uh, brings back like a kind of a shop house, but in a kind of modern forms, okay, which uh, save a lot more of energies, okay. And uh, this one, the common tongue law, using another interpretation of a uh, community malls by. Uh, by create a kind of different type of space inside the project and connect them all together. Okay, of course, the once you we mentioned about Tong Law is one of the most expensive land area in Thailand. Okay, so how to how to uh, make it kind of uh, good for the community? Okay, so the the de designer uh, department of architects. Uh, they, they propose another new concept that okay once uh, the the rental price is very high they even make it if a bit more high high of a bit higher and use and create more of uh, outdoor space 
in order to kind of uh, apply as a sitting area that they can buy in, inside the shop, which could be very small, and then use uh, outdoor space in, to eat or else. Right, so this is a plan that actually is a simple box, but uh, he shift the openings. Okay, so once you walk in, you see that it's become a very. Uh, it's not like you stay inside a building. It's like you still somehow outside. Okay, uh, this one another project, just uh, examples of a new community community malls at at that time. Okay. So this one, uh, architects really create really nice environment for the community that people can share along the walkway, uh, create the step that you can sit and eat and dining. Okay. Right. And then the open wheel that kind of shift rather than like a one straight uh, open wheel, he shift the open wheels. So the wind inside is kind of more dynamic, comparing to a really still one. Apart from that, with the enhance of a fan system on the roof, okay, one is uh, blowing wind down, one is uh, uh, <clears throat> blowing wind up. So it create more kind of a circulation inside the space. Right. Okay, so you see this one is well, you can always see the sun or feel the outside world. Okay. Right, and this shop, sometimes it desires a store, even though the, the rental is expensive, but people can sit anywhere. Okay. Apart from that, uh, so this is the uh, interior environment, which is very nice. And this is a uh, space with the fans that I mentioned before. So you see, even something uh, really normal, but if you apply a good idea, apply a kind of idea that you want it, the project itself to be sustained, then you can, de uh, you can deliver many kind of a creative approach in order to solve the problems. Right, and it's really nice. Also, they use uh, on on top, uh, on the top floor. They also create a kind of a screening. Don't let the direct sunlight reach the glass walls inside. Okay, and then it becomes a kind of a, a really interesting uh, architecture language as well. All right, from a big project, big community mall project, then we come to a more local one. Okay. It's called Minobuli. The project itself, uh, the name project is like uh, inspired from a small city in, Jap in Japan. Okay, that uh, the designer got a really close friend there. Okay, and she liked to kind of simulate a kind of that small scale uh, community inside her projects. Okay, so firstly, this is a kind of big plot of land that uh, she got her own house there with the family. Okay, and she's then she moved her buildings, uh, her office to this area as well, next to this project. Okay, so to, to make it more kind of a, uh, more lively, so she decided that why don't, uh, why don't she take all the kind of old buildings materials, which uh, mainly metals and um, metal sheets and build community mall in uh, Kayova in this area next to her house. Oops. Oops. Sorry. So this, the project itself is very small. Okay. And uh, then they got the water, um, the pond areas that cleaning up the water inside the project as well. Okay. Right. 
Okay, sorry. Okay, so these uh, colorful metal buildings are kind of a many kind of a shop and restaurant, including uh, 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 multi-purpose space. Okay, and uh, next to it, uh, their family house and also office. Right. The white one, the white building, uh, is a multi-purpose space. Okay, so sometimes it's act as gallery, and many times it's also used for like uh, some learning as a learning space, like a ballet for kids around that area. Okay, like this. This is inside. So you see that uh, with this kind of system, they can also hide all the columns. It's like a container design somehow. This is a multi-purpose space, very large one. And then they, they got a kind of a cafe next to it. Right, that this is a space inside, which is very nice. And in order to kind of uh, bring people in, okay, then uh, this is a kind of a kid space for free. That Kids in that area can come and play and enjoy the space, which is very nice. Inside, they can just uh, go in there like a house within house. Okay, and some of a uh, small restaurant, cafe. This one is a restaurant. Okay, so you see most of the material is just metal sheet. Right, uh, which come from her own, own her own office. Even the doors, the door itself also come. Uh, uh, she really used the one that can come from the office as well. And um, before she's doing the project, she also kind of uh, asks the community and say, "What do they want?" So it becomes her program, including this one. The Basketball court because actually uh, before they got uh, public basketball court, but uh, it being demolished to create a uh, governmental buildings there. So people around there have no basketball court anymore. So uh, she kind of create this one for them. And at the back, uh, she divide in as many plots, so people that want to grow their own plants, can kind of come here and rent the space. Which nowadays also develop as a kind of a, a nice walking track for people outside to come and exercise. Okay. And even the, uh, the chicken that uh, she treat herself during COVID time, then it becomes a kind of a, another selling point for her. She can sell a lot of eggs, organic eggs, of course. Okay. And <clears throat> um, this Minopoli designed by a case studio, which are always dealing, dealing with com communities. Okay. So I show you the, the way they deal with the community a little bit. Okay. So she always go to many kind of uh, local communities and try to help developing uh, uh, their conditions. Okay. But not they not just like uh, okay i want to build this but they really ask people in the community to join and share the ideas before making the decisions okay so they got kind of uh, many many projects that she with for she did for the communities and this is her house which is uh, really nice and firstly use a uh, old structure and apply a new one with it so those kind of uh, wooden ribs that's uh, wrap around come from the old house as well. Yep. Okay, so this one I just show you just as an example that actually uh, the transition space, the semi outdoor space is really important and it create life rather than uh, you stay in a box. Yep. 
So even a simple house is very nice. And this one, uh, her, her project that uh, uh, share with friends, like uh, 10 families. Okay. Uh, this one just additional one that uh, she asks uh, 10 people that what do they want? And then kind of uh, compose their requirement altogether. Okay. So this is a really uh, first uh, share living to kind of uh, uh, housing that uh, happenings in Thailand. Okay. okay, so I think that's it for my. Thank you. Thank you, Ha uh, Thank you for your thought provoking perception on the sustainable designs on each of the case studies. Now we'll move on to the Q&A session. Is there anyone in this classroom that would like to ask a question to all of our three lecturers today? <laughs> it's typical lecture room <laughs> situation, isn't it? Oh. Oh, one second. And and I worked, have worked, and have been working with many sustainable projects. Um, some questions were raised, like when when we will consider the word sustainability. Like some some says, the sustainability projects will be counted from the finished of the project, and then when we use it. Or will we will, will that be counted from the starting of the design to the finish of the project and when we use it? Or we are going to count the word sustainability from the beginning of the material. Like let's say if we use trees, if we use timber as a structure, should we count it like 100 years ago as a sustainability? So my, my question is, what is the word, what is the definition of sustainability that we can discuss today and when we should count as the beginning of the word sustainability. I, I think that uh, going back to thinking about the planetary boundaries, mm -hmm. then uh, really all phases of the life cycle counts. Because if you look at the impact of the planet, that does not start and end with, with construction or usage. So um, that means that if you look at it in a planetary context, we can we have to consider all phases. Uh, as architects, you could say um, uh, that that begins maybe not a hundred years ago, but it begins with a consideration of materials already in use from a hundred years ago, and with consideration of um, of site and culture that stretches back. So in that sense, uh, of course, the decisions on a, on a given um, site uh, happen located in today or in the time where you, where you get engaged, but, uh, but there are resources already at play. So in that sense, I think you're very right to say there is a dimension that points back what the resources have already been extracted are already in play and what value do they have how can they be considered forward as the last example showed? Um, and then, of course, thinking about when you cut down a tree, do we use the whole tree or only 40%? Uh, when, when we then have finished construction, how much uh, energy in use? How, how robust is the project for a flood or a storm or a different use in the future? Because, because uh, the planet will consider all phases. Thank you very much, Natalie. I, I think I agree with you. Na? And in addition to hers, um, you know, we, we should have a boundary of the project. And, and, and not only that, I, I think also we think about the process, uh, not, not only material making, but I think uh, the involvement of the community and also resources that we use. Yeah. So there are many dimensions. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Katan Kim. Any more questions? We have a question from a student Me, here. Uh, so, um, hello. Um, I am from the Philippines. 
So like my country ranks low in environmental sustainability. So I'm like curious on how I could openly introduce sustainable architecture as an, a student and like as a starting architect in the future, because like I think my country is not that open to it still because we're stuck in like the old generation and like old techniques of architecture. So I want to know how. Well, I, I think you have some, uh, I think there are other people thinking like you. I've had some great uh, online engagement with the student organization of the uh, architects of uh, the Philippines. So so I think there, there are, again, there are some like-minded people of the young generation. Uh, and that's a starting point because it's difficult to change an industry uh, on your own. Of course, we can all do something, but it's easier if you do it in collaboration and in partnership with others. But uh, but I think, uh, uh, again, uh, we cannot wait until the governments have done all the necessary changes. We need to start in our own practice. And I think a way to start a, as a student is to uh, look at the SDGs when you uh, go into a, um, a design project as a student because you're quite free to, uh, 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 to challenge yourself and your projects consider material choice, consider social value, uh, um, consider the water and the land. Uh, so, so when you, and then you train your ability to, uh, uh, to use, uh, to think about these parameters in your design and you train your ability to present uh, those designs to your teachers. Uh, and, and that training you can use uh, as you go forward. But of course, being, let's say, a newly graduated and the youngest uh, employee at a company, it can also be hard to then experience, well, everybody's just, you know, taking decisions as, as usual and asking how much can we square out of, uh, squeeze out of the site, how many units can we get in at how low a cost, and nobody may be asking uh, about could we do this in a smarter way. And I think our students at the academy are also uh, experiencing this uh, disconnect between how a lot of commercial uh, buildings are erected and then the knowledge that uh, that you will bring into your profession about uh, what we need to do. Uh, so so that, that's also why we sort of uh, uh, try to talk about those uh, roles and understanding that quite difficult path for new sustainable practice because hopefully you will not uh, be... Um, overwhelmed by the fact that that business as usual seems to be carrying on but but find those uh, um, opportunities to move the individual project so maybe maybe you're working on a project as a junior architect and you cannot change everything but you could suggest something about uh, the capturing of rainwater or you could suggest something about uh, uh, natural ventilation that that can be accepted in that context. So at least something happens. Some things get a little better, better uh, accessibility maybe. But um, uh, but the, it it is it it is not easy. So I would also suggest that if you can uh, seek out uh, workplaces where there are somebody who's trying to do something. And I think, and I'm saying that when I meet with. Uh, um, heads of established offices, I'm telling them, uh, please remember that if you do not engage, you will not be able to attract new talent. <laughs> because of course, you will also look at, uh, at uh, when, uh, when you go into uh, your first position as a graduate architect, of course, you need to be offered the position, but you also need to accept it. You know, they are also, uh, they also need you. So, so, uh, so I think we have to, um, um, sometimes be happy to see the benefit of doing a little every time but then also seek out people who are willing to move and have uh, and have that mindset and and they are there in all levels of our industry as these beautiful projects showed go work for those people <laughs> Okay, in addition to Natalie, I think your attitude wins already. Nah? So, so you have potential, absolutely, you know. Uh, uh, then every movement, every of your move, every of your activity counts. It's like butterfly effect, you know. Like start from yourself, for example. 
maybe consume local food, local products, you know, walk to school, stay near the BTS, you know, reduce transportation, for example, you know, or bring your own uh, bottles of water, for example. So, so all kinds, you can start from yourself bit by bit. And, and I think, yes, start with the partners. I, I have learned that to convince people, uh, you need to practice yourself first. And, and also, yes, if you have good friends who have the good, who are good influencer, I think it helps more. <laughs> you know, so, so find the person who in the same wavelength, you know, like Natalie said, they're out there. Yeah, so, so I, I believe that we all of us have a, a I don't know, the magnet to, to draw the same person, the same wavelength together. Okay, I wish you luck. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I actually have one question for all three of you because each of you have a really different pain point. Like Natalie, you have a pain point according to the low cost residential locations and also uh, about innovation of product making, like the trees and also uh, the mechanics of new technology, pretty much. And Adana Sharawan, you have the pain point about water reservoirs and also the living condition of people who are not within the central of the city. Meanwhile, Adana Gawad, you have a really cent central location, like urban designed location where that is for the community with high density. I would like to have one question for all three of you, which is like quite a broad question. So you can answer any way you would like to. But my question is, how does one reach out to others in the surrounding area well enough to understand what is their need to have that locate, to have the specific architectural design? Yeah, maybe we can start. <laughs> Well, um, actually, to understand architecture is, is not easy. Okay. But uh, the most important part is once you really experience it. So, if we as architects can provide many, many good examples in reality, and people kind of uh, go and see and also stay in it, they, do, we, they will feel more. And once they will feel, they know that, okay, this one is good. Then why don't they try to also achieve it as well, right? Probably starting with house, okay? If you make a kind of a really nice sound, really sustained, uh, many people might like to see, come and visit more and more. So you know that, okay, this project is good in what sense, okay? Sustainable design, uh, then also use this approach, okay? Let people experience it, feel it. Apart from, you know, you just put it in, uh, in internet or in the book, that to me is not enough, okay? So we got to start with practice all the time, like uh, the first quest, uh, question from the floor as well, right? Um, it's a very good question, and we could discuss it for for hours. But uh, but it makes me think of uh, a conversation I had with Jan Giel. Do you know Jan Giel? Life between houses. Uh, he's a legendary urban uh, urban planner from Denmark. You heard of him? Um, putting a focus on uh, on people uh, rather than the form of architecture. Uh, and uh, he uh, he told me that uh, that he had the honor of interviewing Ralph Erskine, his hero, when when Ralph Erskine was uh, was close to the end of his life. And at the end of this interview, Jan Gehl said to him, "What makes a good architect?" And Ralph Erskine, an old man at the time, looked and uh, looked at him and said, "You have to love people uh, because in the end, you have to care about the people." Uh, and, and you can listen, you will probably not get everything right, but that care and engagement has to be there. So I think uh, Ralph Erskine said it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Natalie. Yeah, like uh, my uh, exam of the project, it's better to go to the site, you know, 
for for these students yeah you you need to go to the site you don't just google and you understand about the people and the site go to the site talk to the people feel the people right and 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 not not only the people i think yeah yeah when then then they talk about the problems related to environment all the time so so we also have to feel the environment as well right so so it involves many dimensions yeah yeah so so yeah in addition to natalie Ka. okay ha. thank you uh now i'd like to oh actually let me just close this um thank you for all the questions on the floor and thank you for your answer that those are really uh nice and also really intuitive. Now, I'd like to invite Assistant Professor Varairat Kasem Sin, uh, the Associate Dean for Administration and Planning, to give us her remarks. Thank you, Ka Andy. Um, everyone, good morning. Um, this is just a great talk, and I feel like really relaxed and enjoyable listening to this and get a lot of knowledge. So uh, as a conclusion for, for the SOAD talk series 23, leading sustainable change in the built environment, um, I would like to express my gratitude to our insightful guests, um, Kun Natalie Pos uh, Mosin, Dr. Atarawan Dutarat, and Ajahn Ekowat Opat, Opat Pongsagon. Um, um, I like to, to thank you, all of you, for, for, for this talk. And it's such an inspiration talk, inspiring talk. And we appreciate your uh, presentation for shedding light to um, the architect role in playing with 17 sustainable development goals. And there's so many activities and um, suggestions that you have already suggest our students and, <clears throat> and the audience to, um, to play in the critical roles that architects can do for the world. And yes, thank you very much. Um, I would like to pay the um, special thanks to our team as well. Um, especially the ES lab that initiated this talk for us and the supporting lab, which is media lab and sparking unit uh, for making this event possible and fostering knowledge and um, innovation in our community. And most importantly, I would like to take this opportunity uh, on behalf of School of Architecture and Design, uh, King Mukut University of Technology, Tonbuli, to expand my gratitude to our special guest, Kun Natalie Mazin, um, for um, spending her time and contributions to us for um, this talk. Um, we are glad to have you here and thank you very much and hope we can uh, have you in another time. Thank you. Okay, this is it for our talk, talk series 23 by SOAD Architecture Program, together with DES Lab, supported by Media Lab and Sparking Lab. Thank you, Kun Natalie Mossen, Dr. Sharawan Jutarat, and Ajahn Egawat Opat Pungsagawan for this very educational session. I have learned a lot about sustainable design today, 
and I hope everyone here and those who are watching online as well did as well. Thank you very much. Sorry,